So welcome to everyone who is joining us tonight for the Birthplace of Country Music Museum speaker sessions. My name is Renee Rogers, and I am the head curator here at the Birthplace of Country Music Museum. My colleague, Tony, um, Tony Doman, is in the background running tech on this. Um, but we are very excited because tonight we have our special guest, Taylor Haygood, author of the book String Bean, The Life and Murder of a Country Music Legend. We're really excited to have a conversation with him starting in just a few minutes. This is a new book that has only just been released. So um, one thing I will say is that if you look in the chat, you will see a graphic there about the book itself that also has a promo code on it. So if you are interested in getting the book, it has the details on how you can do that and also get a bit of a discount on it. And I would highly recommend the book. I've been reading it in anticipation of tonight's program and it is gripping um, and a very interesting story on so many different levels. Before we get started though, I have just a few housekeeping details um, because we have a good crowd tonight and Taylor is going to be doing a slideshow along with the conversation. Please be sure that you have your video and your microphone turned off in order to optimize the experience for everyone. Um, that way it makes sure that we're not getting distracted by movement or other sounds at the same time. There will be a Q&A with Taylor afterwards. You can put your questions in the Zoom chat and um, Tony will be keeping an eye on those and we will be facilitating those questions after the presentation and the, inner, and the conversation. Another thing to look out for in the next couple of days is a survey um, about your experience and how you enjoyed how what you thought of the program because that kind of information really helps us as we move forward with programming in the future and topics that you might be interested in. So please take the time to fill that out. It's only a two or three minute survey, so it shouldn't take you too long. And then as I mentioned in the chat, we have in, we have information about Taylor's book and how to get hold of it. The other information that we have in the chat at the very top is the Birthplace of Country Music's overall website, the Birthplace of Country Music Museum's website, and also how you can donate if you are so inclined. And if you enjoy the program and you would like to support the museum, it is very easy to do so through that donation link. We offer almost all free and or low cost programming to our community and any donations will help us to keep those programs accessible and engaging. So that is all the house teaming and we are gonna go straight into an introduction with Taylor and we are very excited to have him here tonight. He is a writer, speaker, literary critic, musician, artist, and educator. Taylor is an internationally renowned scholar of the writing of William Faulkner, and he is the author of multiple books, including Faulkner, Writer of Disability, which won the C. Hugh Holman Award for Best Book in Southern Studies. His many articles range from literary criticism to a series of travel essays for the online journal Thrumers, and he has lectured throughout the United States and Europe at universities, institutes, and private clubs. His interest in country music is deep and lifelong, and he has had a particular fascination with banjo playing, construction, and history, which we will definitely be talking to him about later. We are big fans of the banjo here too. A native of Ripley, Mississippi, Taylor is currently a professor at Florida Atlantic University, and we are very grateful to have him here with us tonight because, because the book has just come out, he is in the middle of a lot of press and media events, and he has been traveling a lot, so for him to take the time with us is extra special. Welcome, Taylor. We're so glad to have you with us. Thank you so much. I'm just delighted to be able to do this. I'm a big fan of um, Bristol, Tennessee, and Virginia. And uh, <laughs> I was telling you earlier, it's uh, for somebody who's uh, always loved old country music, and especially as a big Jimmy Rogers fan, uh, and Ralph Peer and the Carter family, uh, this uh, to be able to be uh, work with you in the birthplace of country uh, music museum is just a pleasure and i'm thankful to you and to tony and also to scotty uh who uh, we worked with part of the way i want to say thank you to him too and i, I know he's doing some other things but uh i wanted to make sure and say hello and thank you to him also well and he was hoping to join us so he might be joining as a participant for the first time okay. he doesn't have to do the work he just gets to enjoy it <laughs> right <laughs> 
Well, Taylor, um, the way we were going to do this tonight, you have a slideshow I know that you're going to share with us, but we're going to do this sort of just as a conversation because there is so much in your book. I feel like we could be here for several hours talking about it, but I we won't give away all of its secrets to the audience. But, you know, I was looking at your your page on the Florida Atlantic University's website and all the things that you've been doing and the kind of book that you've written here, I mean, it's it's definitely an academic with the research, but it's very different from um, academic studies of William Faulkner and literary criticism. So how did you come to write a book on David Stringbean Aikman coming from that focus? And when you write a book like this, how is your approach different? What did you have to go through to actually get this book to fruition? Well, I really appreciate that question very much. Uh, it is a very different book. In some ways, uh, I... It sort of feels like my first book <laughs> uh, because it's it's um, it is very different. Uh, the other things I've done have been uh, works of literary criticism, and they've been for uh, an audience of literary critics. Uh, but this is a book uh, that's really for uh, everybody. Anybody can read it. Um, it's uh, designed to be really for anybody. There is a lot of research that went to, went into it, but it was very different. The research for this book was. Um, it involved, uh, you know, it involved some working in archives, but and, I, and I'm very grateful to the Country Music Museum in Nashville and also Middle Tennessee State University. And so there were some places like that uh, that where you had those kind of archives, but a lot of it was interviewing people and, you know, the family of String Bean uh, was very helpful. Um, Patty Hastings, uh, I don't know if she's able to join us tonight, but she's a lovely person, Philip Aikman. Uh, the nephew of Stream Bean. A lot of those people were helpful. A lot of people helped me along the way. Big people. The late Loretta Lynn was very kind to help out with this book. Uh, Whispering Bill Anderson, uh, Ronnie Stoneman, Don Flemons, a lot of people. So there's a lot of that. A lot of looking at census records and um, really a kind of putting together my own archive. A lot of uh, just finding up all the old records of Stream Bean and his, uh, his joke book and, and that kind of thing. And then a lot of research, a lot of work in terms of, uh, you know, really looking at uh, court records. I think I looked at about 3,000 pages of court records connected with the trial. And uh, I read, as part of the work, I read uh, every issue of the Nashville, Tennessean newspaper from about November the 11th, 1973, which is the day after the murders, all the way up until November 1974. I didn't read every word of the papers, but I read uh, every issue and really to try to immerse myself in, in this thing. So it's a very different kind of research. And uh, it's, it is with the University Press, but I wouldn't really call it an academic book. It's, it's a biography slash true crime. Uh, it's kind of a three for one, actually, because you get the life of David Aikman uh, presented as, as a biography, and then you get uh, this murder. It's a true crime story and the investigation. And then you get the, the trial, which let me tell you, the story of the trial, it's like something out of a John Grissom novel, not because of the way I've written it, but just the characters in it are unbelievable, you know. So, but anyway, I guess to answer your question, also just how I came to the writing of it, I'll say very quickly. Um, and with this, I would like to, if it's okay, Renee, to share the screen because uh, in case, especially in case of People don't know what Stream Bean looked like. Here he is. Uh, he has a kind of an unusual anatomy. And uh, you'll notice he's got a very long torso and very short legs. And um, that was a, this was the picture I actually saw of Stream Bean. His real name was David Aikman. I saw a picture of him uh, in a country music book when I was about 12 years old. It was in a um, like a, the school library. And I was really interested in country music and old country music. And I saw this picture of him and I thought, who is this guy? And in fact, one of the people who helped me with this book was a, a hee haw star named Lulu Roman. And when she got on hee haw, she didn't actually know any of the country music people. And, and I asked her, What did you think when you saw this guy he, with this long torso and short pants? And she said, Honey, at the time I was eating so much LSD that I, I thought maybe one of those creatures I had seen in my mind had become real. Uh, you know, she thought maybe he, that had become true. And she, you know, so that was kind of what I thought uh, when I was a kid, like, who is this guy, you know? And uh, anyway, my parents, uh, you know, were talking about him and the fact that he had been murdered. And I, I kind of, um, you know, grew up, I guess, and went off to be a, uh, to be a professor and uh, working on William Faulkner and 
and other things. But uh, maybe about 2017, uh, a video just popped up on my screen of David Aikman, Stream Bean, playing the banjo. And I thought, you know, um, I'd like to read a, a book about this guy. And I'd been reading a lot of biographies and just kind of general history for just anybody to read. And uh, But there wasn't a book. There was a book that had been written in 1975 about the investigation, about the murder. And it had been written by a Nashville Banner reporter. It was out of print. Uh, I, I did manage to snag a, a copy of it, but it really didn't tell Stream Bean's life. And it didn't talk about the trial. So I said, well, I guess I'll be the person to write that story. So that's how I came to the writing of it. Well, that and that's a cool way to come, that you were actually so interested that when you couldn't find it, you made sure that someone else will be able to find it later. So I yes, like that. So talking about String Bean, because some people probably on this um, Zoom know him well, some might not know him as well. Give us a little bit of an insight into his career as a musician. Um, Cause I know it connects to several important moments in country and bluegrass music history. So um, including like Bill Monroe, the Grand Ole Opry, Hee Haw. Um, so tell us a little bit of just about how he became a musician and, and what his impact was. Absolutely. I'd be glad to do that. And uh, of course, there's, you know, obviously a lot more detail in the book, but this will give a little outline about it. Uh, you know, he, he was born in Jackson County, Kentucky, so uh, not too terribly far from Lexington. Uh, as you can see in the date, 1915. And, um, you know, he was um, grew up in that area and uh, started playing the banjo as a, as a kid. His dad played the banjo. And uh, he played a claw hammer style of banjo, so the you know the style where your hand sort of looks like you're hammering. Uh, he also played a two finger style of banjo, so that's a pretty common uh, in that part of Kentucky. There were a number of people uh, playing that. In fact, his nephew, Streaming's nephew, Philip Aikman, still plays the two finger style. So he was doing that kind of thing, but they uh, developed and uh, kind of um, basically it got to the point uh, when he was. Uh, Oh, you know, a young man, and uh, I'll change over to this slide. He was very influenced, uh, loved to listen to the radio, to WSM and the Grand Ole Opry, and was very influenced by this gentleman, Uncle Dave Macon. Something kind of interesting, the name Dave Aikman is very similar to David Aikman. And there were some people in Stream Bean's life, David Aikman's life, who kind of took note of that. But uh, this guy was really something, and he, uh, he he played this open back uh, Gibson kind of banjo, and he would sling it around and twirl it around. And there's actually somebody who does a lot of that now. Is a guy named Leroy Troy, is a good friend of mine, uh, lives uh, outside of Nashville, and uh, he does a lot of this kind of music still. Uh, really interesting person. I don't know if he's been to the birthplace of country music museum, but you might want to check him out sometime. He he gives a great show, and it's in this kind of old style. But anyway. Uh, David Aikman, uh, String Bean, as we know him, uh, he ended up doing a, a being in a banjo contest in 1935 in McKee, Kentucky, which was in, which was in Jackson County. Uh, this was not actually the building, but uh, he was in the old courthouse there in 1935. And uh, at least it did, I'll say it this way, it didn't look like this uh, necessarily at the time. But anyway, he was on this in this contest, he didn't win the contest, but uh, the person who was doing it was a radio personality in Lexington named Asa uh, Martin, and he said, I'd like to uh, hire you. So Stream Bean uh, went, David Aikman went to WLAP in Lexington, and uh, it was Asa who couldn't remember his name, and he looked over at this tall guy, and he said, come over here, Stream Bean, and uh, play a song for us. Now, there's a little bit of controversy. Let me just say, with everything in Stream Bean's life, there are about two or three different stories at least, sometimes four or five. Uh, but he uh, basically, uh, the story is that this is that Asa Martin called him Stream Bean. Some people say maybe he called him Stream Beans, plural. But anyway, the, it was really that singular that stuck with him for so long. And he really did. He looked sort of like a, a bean. Played with some bands in the area early on. This is the, maybe the earliest picture of David Aikman already being called Stream Bean with a group called the Bar X Boys. And uh, they were, that name I think was taken from a, a series of Western novels called the X Bar X Boys. I think that's where they got the name. You'll notice the band is all dressed in uh, kind of cowboy outfits, but Stream Bean is not. He's got, he's barefooted. He's got this kind of look on his face. And, you know, he was kind um, of, he kind of was somebody all his life who would be connected with different groups and yet kind of separate from them. Uh, but this was maybe the earliest picture, at least that I know of, 
of him uh, any kind of performing setting. Uh, by the way, at the time, for anybody who is listening in who's interested in the history of the instruments, he was playing at the time a Gibson RB11. Uh, as you'll notice, it's got a lot of blue on it. It has a lot of celluloid, and the neck of it, the back of the neck was typically painted blue. Sometimes they're called blue banjos. And uh, really, it's covered up. You don't see any of the wood because the Gibson was actually using a kind of a less, I don't want to say inferior, but not quite as good wood for these. So that kind of, um, you know, instead of the, the, the master tone Gibson banjos, like the kind that uh, Earl Scruggs would have played, where you have all that beautiful maple and all, this was not quite as nice, but it was a very fancy banjo. Didn't have inlays. It had silk screen prints on the celluloid fretboard, uh, but it was a Gibson, and, and uh, it was a pretty. It's a pretty special banjo now. But eventually, uh, David Aikman became the first banjo player with Bill Monroe, and this was Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys here. Uh, different iterations of that group, but from 1942 to 1945, Stream Bean was the first the first banjo player to play with Bill Monroe. And he was, uh, you know, they recorded in Chicago. They had some early recording sessions. The first recordings of the Bluegrass Boys with banjo in it is they feature David Aikman playing Stream Beam. Now, he did leave in 1945, and at that point he was replaced by none other than Earl Scruggs. But uh, he went on to be uh, on the Grand Ole Opry. Uh, but while he was, by the way, while he was, and he was with the Bluegrass Boys for that, and while he was with them, he was playing a very, he acquired a very special banjo. The picture on the left is actually a picture of that banjo. Uh, his actual banjo, it's a Vega number no. nine tuba phone, had a very special tuba phone tone ring. The Deering Banjo Company these days has called it the the SUV of tone rings, and uh, it was really well fitted for his style. It's a, by the way, it's a beautiful banjo, uh, beautiful inlays. If you look on the right hand side, you'll see the carved neck. Uh, it's a really, really special instrument. Very different kind of instrument from uh, a lot of banjos that are made now. By the way, uh, it's very much lighter, has a shallower resonator. Don't want to get too technical, too much in the weeds on it, but um, you know, it's it's a very special instrument. Uh, but anyway, uh, it was also during this time that he was putting together his look, this very famous look, and of course that long torso and short pants. By the way, he ended up getting those short britches from little Jimmy Dickens. Uh, he would get those, and string Bean was about 6'3", six, 6'5". Six, there are different accounts of how tall he was, but somewhere in there, maybe 6'4". But uh, anyway, that's what he looked. But you'll notice he painted uh, on his eyebrows, he painted this sort of uh, kind of sad look, and he, and he was really... You know, I don't think he was aware of it, but he was really tapping into the kind of sad clown, Emmett Kelly, uh, in a way, Charlie Chaplin. In some ways, it goes all the way back to the old figure of Poirot, uh, all the way back into the old French and Italian Commedia dell'arte, uh, this kind of sad clown figure. Again, I don't think Stream Bean was thinking about that, but uh, it's very much in that vein. Uh, the long torso look actually kind of... Uh, really kind of replicated the zoot suits of the time. This is a picture of Cab Calloway on the left-hand side of the screen. Would wear those long coats and kind of give that, what was called a zoot suit at that time there in the 1930s. And of course, you know, now uh, you got Snoop Dogg on the right side of the screen and uh, Screen Bean was kind of like Snoop Dogg before there was Snoop Dogg. But of course he wasn't doing the same kind of thing, but he was working in, in traditions whether consciously or not, he was uh, kind of doing things that uh, were in that kind of African-American tradition. I don't think Snoop Dogg was aware of Stream Bean, but it's kind of an interesting historical sort of thing that goes on. Anyway, Stream Bean is eventually married a lady named uh, Estelle Stanford, uh, and she was, uh, they were married in 1945. This is a picture of them as newlyweds, Stream Bean out of costume. When you see this picture, he almost looks a bit like Jimmy Stewart, a little bit passive resemblance to the screen actor, uh, Jimmy Stewart. Uh, but uh, they bought a little house on a place called Baker Station Road, little tiny house. I've actually been in the house. And uh, let me tell you, I don't know if you can see it in this picture too well, but the, that roof slants down so much that a guy who's 6'3 or 6'5 would have to bend over uh, to get through it. I'll just say it that way. But a very, very tiny house. And they actually bought it with their best friends, Grandpa and Ramona Jones. And here's a picture of them here. 
And they had a house, they, they basically went and bought the house together, it had about 140 acres. This was north of Nashville, Tennessee, pretty close to Greenbrier. They had 140 acres. Uh, there was that tiny house that David and Estelle lived in. Usually it's pronounced Estelle with a lot of emphasis on the first syllable. But anyway, uh, they all lived uh, right there. The, David and Estelle lived in the small house, and then there was a little bit bigger house right beside it where the, the Joneses lived. And uh, they, they were there uh, for a while, and the Joneses ended up going up to the state of Virginia uh, where they were on a show up there with, uh, in, uh, sort of in the Washington, D.C. area. And uh, anyway, they would be back and forth, but they would be friends for, for throughout their lives. Uh, about 1950, Stream Bean uh, produced a book of his jokes and that kind of thing. And also something people don't know much about is that uh, like uh, maybe just uh, maybe a year after he died, there was a book put out kind of detailing his style of play and the music. So it's a kind of an interesting uh, thing with that. But anyway, he was also recorded, and I want to just play this quick video, and then I'm just about uh, through with my spiel on this part of it, I guess. But I do want to play you this video from, uh, this is an interesting video. There was a series of these color uh, films that were taken and put, they were actually made for TV. But this was early 1950s, maybe 1952, maybe. Uh, Stream Bean is performing on the Grand Ole Opry in color. And this will give you a little sense of kind of what his shtick was. So you'll see him. Uh, he's going to play he's playing a song called Hillbilly Music Going Round. And it's uh, he's excited about uh, every time the Grand Ole Opry starts playing, he's excited. It's Hillbilly Music. And he'll do a little dance, a little shuffle with it. And at the end, you'll see him flip his hat, kind of like a little Charlie Chaplin move. And it'll give you an idea of uh, what string bean was like. So and he's playing his Vega number nine tuba phone banjo. So I'll go ahead and play this. When you walk up to the jukebox and you slip a nickel in, you can bet your bottom dollar when that wreck starts, you spin to it. Here at the fiddle and the guitar, that honky honk sound. It's that hillbilly fever that's just spreading all around. Oh, the hillbilly fever going around. Or it's good old mountain music dropping down. I'll be robbing castle store to ride and slipping around. Uh, you can see there he's always got some lines in between his verses. He's saying, oh, I feel so unnecessary and all kind of other things. And he's all one of his big lines is he'd say, uh, come on, five. And he's talking about his five string banjo. Uh, by the way, I got a good buddy who's a big piano player. I worked with a number of people, Hank Williams Jr. and others named Tim McDonald. And uh, he, uh, excuse me, uh, is uh, from all over the place, Kentucky and other places. He's doing an album right now. He actually did a song called Come On Five, inspired by String Bean. He's doing an album as we speak of String Bean music. And speaking of albums, uh, here are some of the albums that String Bean put out. They're all done by the Star Day Record Company. So uh, in the 1950s, of course, Sun Records in Memphis really killed country music. But there were some that uh, in Nashville that really dug in. Of course, you know about the Nashville sound. Some people don't know about Star Day, which was a small label that really dug into old time country music and uh, did some. Uh, their, one of their big hits early on was Y'all Come uh, by Arlie Duff. And then uh, this uh, Star Day Records features String Bean. And uh, these are some of them. You'll notice the one in the middle is a salute to Uncle Dave Macon. He actually did meet his idol, Uncle Dave Macon, toured with him, and Uncle Dave actually left a banjo to him, one of his Gibson banjos, an RB1, and he's playing it there. And by the way, in Stream Bean's house, that picture you see there by the fireplace, that, that fireplace right there, that's still the same. A lot of the house has changed since then. Uh, anyway, he did go on to become a founding member, charter member of the show Hee Haw. I'm sure everybody... On this uh, uh, watching today is familiar with it. That's a show I was. I know I was watching as a kid. And started in 1969, and he was the scarecrow in the field. And uh, he made so much money for it uh, from it that he wrote a song called "Me and My Old Crow." 
and uh, did a, a whole album of it. And uh, here he is. Uh, here's the picture of the album. This is on Nugget Records. So by this time, Star Day was just about defunct. And uh, so he put this one out on Nugget Records. And uh, by the way, the back of this has an, a write-up by Hank Williams Jr. Uh, Stream Bean kind of took him under wing to some extent, I guess you could say. And uh, by the way, it's also on the show. By the way, uh, Stream Bean was doing a, a kind of a thing called Letter from Home, where he would read a letter that he had written out, you know, from uh, kind of a funny letter from from home, as it were. And uh, he would say, it was in this show, though, that I think is where it's kind of hard to pin some of this down, but it seems that it was in Hee Haw that he would reach around and say, oh, I got the letter right here next to my heart, heart, heart. Anyway, 1969 is on Hee Haw, but on November the 10th, 1973, David and Estelle Aikman came home to their little house here from uh, the Grand Ole Opry, and there they met uh, with people who murdered them. They were found the next morning. Grandpa and Stream Beam were going to go on a hunting trip to Virginia. And Grandpa got up real early in the morning, drove over toward the house, and he noticed that there was no smoke coming from the chimney. Normally, Stream Beam would get up and build a fire in the fireplace, but there was no smoke. And uh, he saw he drove up the long dry dirt driveway, and you'll see an X over to the left. That's where he saw Estelle lying in the field, uh, shot in the arm and the back of the head. And then he ran up to the house and where the ex is inside the house, uh, David Aikman was lying dead in front of the fireplace, shot through the heart. Uh, it was a devastating murder for the city of Nashville, devastating murder for country music industry. Uh, prior to that time, the country music stars were fairly accessible. There was a lot of openness. And Nashville, I think, felt like a small town in a way, still. Uh, it was already getting a lot of big city problems, but now that really came glaring into view. It was a very terrifying thing. A lot of the country music stars began to put a lot of uh, security walls and cameras up. And by the way, there was another murder in the city not long after this. And at first, it was Hank Snow's guitarist, James Widner. People were worried that maybe this was a copycat deal or a serial killer. Uh, but eventually, uh, the, uh, the, some of the investigators, these are two of the most famous, Sherman Nickens on the left-hand side. and. Tommy Jacobs uh, on the right hand side. Tommy Jacobs uh, would be a particularly well known figure uh, in this uh, whole thing, and there were some others. But anyway, they were involved in the investigation and they finally uh, corralled uh, these two gentlemen, Doug Brown and John Brown. And they had a Doug had a brother named Charlie. Uh, his name was actually Charlie Brown. And uh, they also had a, another brother named Roy. All four were actually arrested. But anyway, in the trial, uh, the trial ended up being uh, for these two gentlemen, and um, there were a number. Of, the, the lawyers are just very fascinating people. Arnold Peebles represented John Brown. Joe Binkley represented Doug Brown. Joe Binkley was the most, uh, probably the highest paid lawyer in all of Nashville at the time. Kind of a mystery uh, how they paid for that, uh, because uh, the idea was the, the the official story was that the murder motivation was murder was money, but Three thousand a watt of three thousand dollars was was left on the body of Stream Bean and two thousand on the body of Estelle. So it's kind of an interesting thing. If it was about money, why was that money left behind? Was there even more money stolen that was never accounted for? Uh, certainly, paying for Joe Binkley would have cost some money. Uh, but anyway, Thomas Shriver uh, was the the uh, DA at the time, and he was prosecuting the trial. He was actually up for re-election that year. Uh, but anyway, a very interesting story. I won't tell you how it all ends, but uh, that's that's basically the deal with that. Uh, and I'll go ahead and share this with you. That's the promo code uh, for this thing. Uh, but uh, anyway, I guess I'll, I can stop sharing for a little while and we can just come back together. Renee, that was a long spiel. I hope I haven't put <laughs> That's OK. Well, and it, it's it's given me some starting points for a few questions to dig a little bit deeper now. So that's perfect. Um, I'm going to stick with the. The sad part of the story first, and then I want to go back a little bit to String Bean just as a musician. But, um, you know, you were saying about the idea, how long was it between the actual crime and the investigators finding the culprits? How long did that take? And, and why, you know, you mentioned that they thought at first that the the motive was was murder. And I think I remember reading somewhere that, that String Bean was one of those... Um, old timers who didn't really believe that banks were safe places. And so there was always that whoever committed the crime might have known that he was the kind of person who might have money at home. But I didn't realize that there was money left behind in such, in such an obvious way, at least. 
Well, that's that's really the rub of the whole thing. You know, it's uh, I think one of the things I found and I'm sure there are people listening in who are very familiar with the story, the kind of the standard story. Uh, digging into it, I, I kind of found that, you know, there are a lot of things that kind of, there's a lot more to it. Uh, and it is, a, it's, it is the rub that money was left behind and that, you know, that's, it's, it's a problem. Um, it is true that David and Estelle both uh, came of um, age. Uh, basically they uh, came of age during the great depression. They did not trust banks. It is a little bit, I will say this, there, there are accounts of, um, of David and Estelle actually putting money in banks. And uh, I actually spoke to their family lawyer, Will, William Feynman, and they had some cash in a, in a sort of a strong box in a bank. And uh, they also, there were reports, at least, that there were different bank accounts, where they had actual straight up bank accounts in a number of different banks. And there's a story that's been told uh, in the Opry that, uh, you know, people said, listen, you know, you can trust banks again. So, so there's actually a lot of conflicting information. This is very common in the string bean story, a lot of conflicting information. And I should tell you that that is part of the string bean lore that a couple of decades after the murders that one of the, one of the owners of the house claimed to have found money hidden in the fireplace. Um, and it was verified by Tommy Jacobs. And so there's no reason. I want to say Mr. Jacobs is very helpful with this book, so I don't have any reason not to believe him. But I will tell you that uh, there are, you know, some there is some doubt that runs around about that also. So, you know, who knows? It's kind of hard to, to nail some of that down. But you ask how long did the, the, the investigation take? They actually, they actually identified the Brown family uh, fairly soon after, within about a week. Uh, and there began to be this kind of uh, standoff, you know, um, there. And the, the investigators actually stayed in the house, which is really something because it's a tiny little house. OK, uh, it's, you know, the current owners of the house. I, I know they're lovely people. And, you know, they said, you know, it's kind of a two person house. <laughs> and, uh, it, you know, the idea of four big investigators living in this place is kind of hard to get your head around, I guess. But anyway, the, it lasted, the investigation lasted into January. So it went from about November the 11th into, into January of the next year when the arrests were made. And uh, there's no doubt, by the way, that, I mean, the Browns were, were in it. It's just not totally clear exactly what everybody's role was in it. Uh, the deal was that Charlie Brown was actually had a talent agency, lived up the street, up the road in Greenbrier. It's not clear whether or not Stream Bean worked with him. They, it is known that Stream Bean had lunch with Charlie and his wife, so they did know each other. Uh, also, Stream Bean, uh, there was a, a cave, a kind of a country music theme park cave in Kentucky that uh, Stream Bean was offering to invest in, and he had about $20,000 in cash. And shortly before the murder, he was he was talking about that. And uh, Charlie Brown was at that meeting. So, you know, would have known about it. Uh, so he was he never went to trial, uh, Mr. Brown. Uh, but that was uh, that was sort of a close uh, kind of a situation there to where that's how that that news got out. But anyway, it was about uh, about two months, basically, was how long it took for that investigation to to come to a close. It resulted in the arresting of four of the Browns, uh, but only two of them ended up going to trial. And um, it sounds like it'd make a really good true crime podcast too, with all of the intricacies of it. You could probably get really dig deep in that. But one of the other things mm -hmm. that I wondered about, um, you know, you mentioned also about how deeply it affected the Nashville community at the time, the music community. Um, and both just like that exposure to knowing that places can be unsafe but but how did it affect anything performance like were there were performers coming out and doing anything to sort of help the family or to support the invest how was that was there any interaction between the actual sad part of the story and the Nashville community absolutely yeah well first of all there was a lot of pressure a lot of pressure on the investigators um you know Roy Acuff uh, was he showed up on the morning motor, morning after the murder and he was very outspoken. He was calling for you know the heads of whoever had done this thing. Uh, he um, in fact uh, he was very upset. So it turns out that the death penalty had just recently been brought to cessation before this murder. So that wasn't an option. The death penalty. 
Uh, and Roy Acuff was particularly outspoken, but there were a lot of people. Bill Carlisle was there the day after the murder. Um, a lot of people connected with the Opry. Grandpa Jones, he was the one, you know, who discovered the bodies. He gave a very gripping, very gripping account, uh, you know, testimony at the trial. Um, but yeah, they were, Stream B was close to everybody. Porter Wagner, uh, you know, Dolly Parton had been on the show and knew on Porter Wagner's show at that point and knew Stream Bean and, you know, Loretta Lee and all, all these people were very, very close. Uh, Oscar Rollins from Lonzo and Oscar was was involved in providing testimony. So there was actually uh, quite a lot of support. Uh, the, the Grand Ole Opry, the Friday night after these murders, the Grand Ole Opry uh, took a moment of silence and, and they basically had a memorial show. They did the next night, too. There was a special WSM thing. There was a lot that that happened uh, in the way of support, um, you know, for uh, for stream being in Estelle. They were very beloved. And I will tell you this, later on, so, you know, after everything was squared away with the trial, basically, you know, I'm not going to give too much away and tell you this because anybody can find this out very quickly, but Doug and John Brown did end up being convicted and and, uh, went to prison. Doug actually died in, he actually died in the prison in Tennessee where the fictional Hannibal Lecter was going to be transferred. Never quite made it there, but uh, I think or he broke out as he got there. But anyway, he, that was where he died. John Brown, though, uh, had a big change of life, and he uh, became converted uh, to Christianity. And he, you know, his he became, um, his wife was working as an accountant for the Cornerstone Church in Nashville, big church in Nashville. And uh, the, the, in fact, the minister at that church had been convicted of, of murder as a 20-something-year-old. And that that guy, he would he to this day he hires convicts. There was a big push, parole, a lot of parole hearings. Uh, Nashville changed a lot in the night from especially in the 1990s and 2000s. And a lot of the friends of David Aitman began to die. And uh, but they were very outspoken. They said this John Brown should never be paroled. But there were new elements in Nashville. And they said, hey, he's had a change. He's he feels guilty about it and and so so forth and so on. And in 2014, uh, he was actually finally uh, uh, paroled. And it was very controversial in Nashville, a very, very controversial parole. Um, so, you know, it was, you know, I'll tell you something interesting about it. John Brown to this day, while he admits to guilt and so forth, he'll, he'll say to you, look, um, you know, I don't really remember this thing. And Arnold Peebles had a very, very different scenario. Uh, I mean, it's kind of his job to have a different scenario, but the gentleman who represented John Brown had a very different sort of scenario about how the murder actually took place. But I guess we can dig into that a little more if you want to. Well, no, I will leave that. I think people should definitely <laughs> dig into your book to learn more about that. So Fair enough. I want to go back um, before I have just a couple more questions at the end, but I wanted to go back just to ask a little bit more about the persona that String Bean mm-hmm. created. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, because I mean, that is definitely something that you see performers do back then and you see performers do it now. Certainly when you use you use Snoop Dogg as a as an example of a similar sort of look, that long Mm -hmm. stringy string bean look, but a lot of performers create a persona. So where do you think that came from? Did is there anything that you found in your research that leads to why he might have created that persona and and what made it be that particular sort of sad, sad clownish type? connection well that's that's a very interesting uh i think a very interesting thing um you know he was a very curious person stream being david Aikman. and you know in a way he was a very very quiet soft-spoken very humble man uh, all his life and um and yet he wore he wore this outrageous costume you know and he was there was something outrageous about him, you know. So how does that work? You know, h- how do you become that person uh, and do that? You know, there was a guy who was playing on the uh, Renfro Valley show, uh, which was in Kentucky. And it, some people think and say that Stream Bean kind of modeled some of his look on him. But, you know, where did this come from uh, is, is kind of one of the mysteries, you know, that look. Uh, Stream Bean didn't really say a whole lot about it. Let me tell you. For the record, String Bean didn't say a whole lot about anything. There are a handful, 
there are a handful of interviews, uh, but there's not much. He was not. Now, by the way, sometimes people will say he couldn't read or write, but I will tell you, I have held in my hands uh, a letter, one of those letters from home uh, that, you know, he wrote. So, you know, it, as far as I know, he, it, it, he may not have known at a certain point in his life, but he clearly knew how to read, read and write on some level. But, but he was not somebody who kept a diary. There are not tons of letters. I know of one letter from Estelle to her family. There may be others, but I, I was only able to find one. So there's not a whole lot. You don't get a whole lot. Stream Bean is a very mysterious guy. And kind of what made him tick, uh, that's, that's not real easy to, to pin down. Uh, but I will say this. The Stream Bean persona was very organic. You know, it, it came out of who he was. Uh, there is a sense in which Stream Bean is kind of the essence of David Aikman. Quiet but soft spoken, wry sense of humor, uh, very kind of odd sense of humor. Uh, he, he was known to call people up and speak in that person's voice uh, to the person. You know, he did his prank calls. And so, you know, but it, it's kind of hard to pin it down. I, I can say where the, the sources were in a kind of a larger sense, but as far as his making a statement about it, it's just not there. But there's a lot of mystery around Stream Bean. I, let, me, let me tell you, there are a lot of, one of the biggest things I found in this was there are some questions that are hard to answer at this present time. Now, I, listen, people, I have no doubt that more information will come out and, and so forth. But, you know, I did the best I could and, you know, to find what I could. But at this point, there are a lot of mysteries. But but there's a but I will say this and I'll, I'll let this go. You know, that that persona and the person were so closely tied. Uh, people in his everyday life called him string bean or st they usually said string. Sometimes they called him bean, but that was, you know, they didn't, it was rare to call him David. Uh, now Estelle did. Uh, and the one letter I could find where she wrote to her family, she called him David, but you know, th that was a very inseparable kind of thing. It's the same way with grandpa Jones, grandpa, he became grandpa Jones when he was 20 something years old. And it was a great marketing movie. He would never be able to to outlive his marketing and he'd never get too old for it, you know? Yeah. So I hadn't thought of it that way. That's, that's true. Um, the other thing that we've talked about a little bit is you brought up string beans, banjos. And I know that the banjo sort of became a journey for you while you were doing this book. So can you tell us a little bit about that too? Because I know, didn't you build a banjo during I, this cross? Yes, yes ma'am. I did. Yeah. No, I, I, um, I got, uh, I've been playing the banjo since I was 12 years old. My, my parents uh, bought me a Harmony. I don't know if we have any banjo players listening, but they bought me a Harmony banjo from Sears catalog. And uh, I was about maybe 11 or 12 years old. And, you know, and um, so I was always interested in the banjo and interested in kind of how it was built. I had gotten that Earl Scruggs uh, book from way back about the banjo. And the last part of it talks about how to, how to do pearl inlays and all of that. And I was always fascinated with that. And, but when I got into the book, I, I realized, I think when I realized, and I want to say a very special thank you to a couple of people, uh, Jack Clutter of the Country Music Hall of Fame really bent over backwards to, you know, everything from the serial number to the build of the banjo, really, you know, he, he showed me, told me about how it was built. And also uh, Joe Spann of Grun uh, Guitars in Nashville has the Stream Beans other banjo. The, the one that Uncle Dave Macon gave him. And they really, really gave me these details, which I so appreciated. But I think once I realized that that Vega number nine was just a very different instrument from the the, the way I know banjos, you know, the, the kind of Gibson master tone style that so many people uh, copied, I ended up kind of upgrading to a, a Hondo two, uh, which is not a big upgrade, but it was what's so-called master clone. But it had the same kind of tone ring as a master tone and all that. And it had the kind of big, thick five ply uh, rim on it and all that. But I, I said, OK, you know what? I, I'm going to have to dig in. I understood that I figured out at a certain point that I'm going to have to dig in to this instrument really to understand the string beans instrument, but also string bean himself, because the banjo and string bean are, are tied together. They are intimately connected. And uh, so what I did, I went on, uh, I managed to find a resonator. Uh, uh, on eBay, 
that was actually built about the same time as string beans. It's a beautiful torrified maple with the rosewood. It's made up of eight pieces of uh, maple connected, uh, separated with rosewood. And I basically built the banjo up from that. I built my own neck out of the same kind of torrified maple, did the, the design and cut my own inlays. It's kind of an interpretation, uh, uh, kind of a mix, a mashup of those uh, styles. And I, and I did that and I, I learned really in doing that everything about the guts of the banjo. And it's a, I'm gonna tell you, it's a fascinating thing. Uh, you know, some really great, there's a recent book, maybe came out about a year ago about the history of the African, of the African roots of the banjo. There are some great writings out there. Uh, again, you know, I, I don't know if any of those folks have come your way or not, but I got to tell you, um, really Christina, some great stuff. We had Christina Gaddy here at the beginning of the year as our first speaker sessions speaker for 2023. Her book is great, you know, yeah. and it really goes into those, you know, those kind of the, the old paintings. And I mean, it's just great stuff. And, and the history of the instrument is just, uh, it's just incredible. So. So yeah, it was you know it was a lot of late nights working on the head, you know I didn't really have time but uh, but uh, to do it but I managed to pull it off and uh, you know it's uh, if for anybody who's a true professional banjo builder I would never want you to see it you know but uh, but for me it, it worked out pretty well I'll say this that's the best materials of a banjo I've ever had in my life <laughs> but so far it hasn't fallen apart so well, that that's wonderful and you know. Just I have a two two small questions before we head over and let um, some of the questions from the chat that we've gotten from our audience. And it looks like we've had a, quite a few people chatting away in there. Um, but hey. first, I come from an academic background myself, so I understand the thrill of research and how it's it's hard to stop sometimes because there's always yes. a new story to find. So first off, I just wondered what your favorite story or memory that came out of your research for this book was. Well, uh, that's a great question, and I, I do understand the source of, of your asking it very well. Um, there were a couple, I mean, one of the great stories, you know, talking to Lulu Roman was just great, and when she told me that story about seeing Stream Bean for the first time was just great, but I think probably one of the biggest moments for me, uh, you know, probably was getting to meet some of the, you know, Mr. Bill Anderson, and, and probably, you know, getting an email from Loretta Lynn was surely the highlight of my life in a lot of ways. I mean, I always loved Loretta Lynn anyway. And, you know, she sent this thing. She said, you know, uh, when I first arrived in Nashville, uh, my husband, uh, Doolittle, and then she says, that was my husband. And it just broke my heart. I wanted to say, yes, ma'am, I, I know that. I know <laughs> that, you know. So, but it, no, there were there were a lot of uh, amazing moments, but those are the some of the ones, I guess, that stand out for me. The people who took the time to to help me out uh, you know, I, I'm not anybody. I, I don't have a track record of writing about country music, and for them to to help out was uh, incredibly generous. I, I feel very grateful to them. Well, yeah, I can imagine speaking with Loretta Lynn must have been quite a thrill. I can't even imagine what that felt like. Unbelievable. Yeah, and so now that you've you've done this, the book is out. Um, the world is. And I, I've already read two or three really great reviews about it, so I know that it's being well received. But Man. has has it given you the bug for this type of type yeah. of research? Is there someone else that you would like to tackle, or if not you, someone else that you hope someone will tackle, so that you can read that story? Well, I, I think there are a lot of great uh, uh, country music uh, biographies yet to be written. Uh, there's a very wonderful biographer named Diane Deekman, and and she does a great newsletter, by the way. And she wrote a, a prize-winning biography of Marty Robbins and one of Farron Young. And she's working on one on Randy Travis right now. And she's incredibly talented. And I, I think she's uh, somebody who, who's really doing a great job. Uh, for me, uh, now at the moment, I'm actually doing a different biography. I'm writing about a, a writer, but actually a writer from Florida named Theodore Pratt. <clears throat> Pardon me, but uh, I, I have, I do have an interest. I, I had the great pleasure of writing an article on Stream Bean for Bluegrass Unlimited. It's really great working with them, uh, and I would love to do more of that kind of thing. And I do have an interest, uh, maybe at some point, in doing a biography. Of course, there are a lot of work, but and we'll see how it goes. But I, I do have a real interest in writing about uh, the singer Charlie Rich, uh, who sang behind closed doors and. Uh, you know, the most beautiful girl in the world. I think he was a really fascinating person, very difficult to pigeonhole. 
Uh, he, he played country, he played jazz, had this great uh, voice. And his career has a very interesting arc. He came up to a point of a high point in his career. And right in the moment of success, the whole thing imploded you know, from within. And it's a very fascinating story. So it, that's something I've been kind of toying with. And, you know, we'll see how things go. But um, I guess that would be my answer right now. Well, if you, if you do that, Taylor, we'll be happy to have you back to talk about it. So <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate it. Well, this has been fascinating. And I know we have only cut, we are very only at the tip of the iceberg of the story. So I will remind yeah. everyone that Taylor's book is newly released. You can get it from the University of Illinois Press and probably other outlets. But if you use the University of Illinois Press, he does have a promo code you can use. And I can say from my own reading that it is definitely worth buying and and tackling um and learning the full story of string bean and and the sad story of string bean but also his impact and all that so we really appreciate you being here with us to share that that's thank you so much and thank you for your kind words i appreciate it so much and, and it can and by the way yeah you can buy it anywhere uh there's some kind of technical glitch on amazon that's trying to be worked out uh it says it's not going to be re released till may the 23rd that's not true it's published now but there's some glitch there, but you can get it on there. You can get it on Barnes and Noble. It looks like to me, you can get it just about everywhere, especially online there. Also it's in select Barnes and Noble stores. So uh, actually in your area, I don't know if there's a Barnes and Noble in the Bristol area, but probably in that area and Nashville in, uh, well, pardon me, in like Lexington places like that, uh, they, have a, they will have it there too. Yeah, we have a Barnes and Noble for anyone who's local. Remember there's a Barnes and Noble in Johnson City, so you can go there. <laughs> Oh, yeah, well, Johnson City, right. Yeah. Well, we are going to turn to the chat, and Tony, I think, is going to facilitate the question. She's been keeping an eye on that. And also, there's quite a few comments, so we'll read those out, too, so that everyone, because I think there's been some insight coming from a few other people. Um, Tony, I'm going to hand it over to you now. Yeah, and there's a train going by, so if y'all hear a train sound, <laughs> <laughs> it's going by right now. Um, and I just also want to say, Taylor, that this is such a great conversation. I'm so inspired and I can't wait to read the book. Um, and the, the one of the first questions here in the chat actually says, will the book be available at the Birthplace of Country Music Museum? <laughs> uh, I, I don't have, thank you so much, Tony, by the way. I'm glad you're excited and I hope you enjoy the book. And I don't know. I have no idea. I know that uh, <laughs> Illinois the press, University of Illinois Press, uh, partners with the, another partner of the Country Music Hall of Fame, and they do a lot of country music uh, books and all the big biographies. So I don't know what I don't know what they're doing at the moment. I, I, I have to find out. I'm sorry to say I don't know the answer to that. Well, and I, I can say we've worked with Michael Rue at the University of Illinois two or three times on a few different books where we've done something like this. So I'm sure if he might have already been in touch with our museum manager. I can't answer it either myself, but he certainly has our contact details to talk about that. So yeah, he's really that. great too. That might he, really he, he always reaches out to us when there's a book he thinks will fit our content that we'd be interested in, which has been lovely for us. So watch this space, I would say, but in the meantime, but certainly if you want to get the discount, it's through the University of Illinois. Is that correct, Taylor? That's correct. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and um the train has passed, so. I can speak more clearly now. Um, another comment said, asks, did String Bean and Estelle have children? Uh, no, you know, there is a, a sort of rumor uh, that has kind of gone around that they might've had a child, but uh, uh, the, the, so far as I could tell, again, something may yet come to light, but so far as I know, there, there's no truth to that rumor. And another question asks, um, were there any surprises to you, at least, during your research of string bean? Yes, there were. Uh, probably one of the big surprises, and I think would be a surprise to a lot of people, is that string bean actually was had a first wife before he was married to Estelle. A lot of times, you know, everybody talks about Estelle and string bean, and that's this love story, and, you know, but really... Um, he had another wife before that, which kind of caught me by surprise. There were some other things along the way. Probably some of the biggest surprises to me, for me in the process, had to do more with the murders, though. Just, uh, just how kind of, how many kind of really unresolved things really there were. 
you know, about it. Uh, I mean, even the jurors after after the trial, they say, well, we're not even quite sure what happened. You know, we're, we think the Browns were there, but there's a lot of stuff. And again, as you were saying, Renee, when you really start to dig into the the details, there are a lot of surprises there, actually. So that those without going into the details of them and giving them away, um, you know, that's that's the thing. There, by the way, there is one other thing maybe along the lines of what you're asking about. I think I don't know if this is a surprise exactly, but I mean, I think one of my surprises to me was why no one had really done this book before. I mean, it's a great story. You know, it's it's incredible. And it has everything of a great story. And why, why had that story not be written, been written? And as I worked on it, I realized it's because really for the story to have the full impact, you have to really grasp and understand and, and be bought in and, you know, to string being. You have to really understand who he is as far as being a persona, who he was in the country music industry, how much the people around him loved him. You have to understand that in order for the murder to have the, the to feel the full impact of it. But what happens is when you get into the murder, is the characters loom so large in that that you sort of lose stream being in the shuffle. So it's a very, very hard book to write. A lot of biographies end with the death. This one's just getting started with the death of the subject. And, and so trying to keep it all together where the reader doesn't forget about stream being altogether, and and it, it, that was very, very hard. So I don't know if it was exactly a surprise, but it was definitely the challenge of it. This was the hardest book I've ever had to write, you know, for that reason. Yeah. Um, and then Diane Conco asks a question. She says, without giving away any information you may not want to, how did Estelle wind up outside of, and string bean inside of the house? Um, who was running in which direction? Well, I, I hate to, I, I do hate not to answer something, but it is true. I, that's one. I'm so sorry. Uh, who was it that asked the question again? I'm sorry. That was a Diane Conco. That's Conco. I, I'm so sorry to have to do this, but this is one time I'm going to have to say that one. That one. It's too. It's too difficult for me to explain it in a short period of time. So I think with the book is a little bit easier to follow all that in the context. Sorry. Well, and Diana is one of our volunteers. So Diana, we will have this book in the volunteer library soon, as soon as I finish it. So <laughs> you can go and get the library that you can get the book there. Sorry. Um, and then Scotty, who has used a alternative name in the chat here, <laughs> Scotty asks, uh, did the Bra uh, brothers, the Brown brothers have a history of crime prior to the murders? Yeah, they did. Again, without going into detail, they, they actually did. Uh, in fact, um, again, I mentioned Charlotte Brown uh, had a had a pretty ugly uh, sort of record, and uh, particularly. But um, yeah, they did. Like, the, the short answer is yes, they did. In fact, I'll say this much. In fact, um, they were already suspects in other crimes, and those crimes just never were. They were never tried for them because. None of them were as big as this, but uh, they they were they were pretty they were definite stinkers. I mean, listen in the story, in this story, the Browns are really bad. You know, they're they're bad. Whatever John Brown may have turned or changed into, uh, in the time of the murders, he he was bad. They were all very bad. And David and Estelle Aitman had no enemies. They were about as innocent as a, any human could possibly be so far as anybody knows at this point. Uh, so the contrast between the, the murderers and the murdered, you know, it wasn't as if so far as anybody knows, it wasn't as if, you know, David Aikman did something, you know, not to say that anybody brings murder on themselves. I'm not saying that, but it, you know, they were just the, the, the contrast is so extreme that uh, there's not, you know, it, it's that's part of the pain of the story because it, you can't find the, the closest thing that that stream bean ever had to an enemy uh was jim denny who was the manager at the grand Ole opry at one point who was known to everybody to be hard to deal with and ernest tubb wanted allegedly to shoot him at one point that's the only person who ever even came close to being even an enemy and that's that's really stretching it so but yeah the browns had a record prior to that time yeah 
they were, we'll say this, they were definitely, uh, be, you know, the, being dug, there was also a lot of digging into what they were up to. So, yeah. Yeah, and then uh, William Rigby asks, do you have any idea if David uh, Stringbean Aikman was aware of Butler Stringbean's May, a very popular African-American performer who died in 1917, just before recording became common? Uh, they think that he did no recording. Well, so that that's a that's a great question. Um, I could not find any awareness. I, again, I'll just say this much: um, I, maybe it's out there. I I just could not find it. You know, there's a there's a new book out on Robert Johnson by the biographer of Robert, you know, the person who did a lot of biographical work on the, on the blues singer, Robert, uh, Robert Johnson. And that, that biographer ended up going totally against his own research and started claiming that Robert Johnson, it was, he had the wrong Robert Johnson. It was a really interesting book that's uh, just been published. And, uh, you know, just to show kind of how tough it is sometimes to, to find some of the connections uh, that's a great question. It's actually a question I, I had, but I couldn't find anything. It, it may have been that uh, David Aikman knew about it. it. That's not where the name came from. I don't think Asa Martin was thinking about that. Uh, but I really don't. At this point, I don't know. There may be a, somebody out there who can find that answer. and It may be under my nose and I just missed it. But it, it's a great question. question. I appreciate it very much. And uh, Dave asks, do you know if the Opry might release an album or DVD of his live performances on the Opry? Well, I I, I think it'd be my time for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I uh, Pardon me. The, the Country Music Hall of Fame uh, has a number of those live performance uh, recordings. I don't know if they're the ones who own the rights to them or not, but uh, they have them if you go on the online uh, thing you do have to kind of dig for them uh, but they have a lot of those those performances and by the way they're great performances um, you know is is that going to happen I really don't know I, I you know I do have some questions about that I mentioned uh, my friend Tim uh, McDonald uh, working on an album um, you know what uh, is going to happen is not clear I, I don't I could be wrong but I don't think that stream bean has actually been uh, inducted into the hall of fame yet. I don't think so, you know, who knows what may yet come. Uh, but I, I agree uh, that uh, those, those performances would be great to have out there. Maybe this book will prompt them to do that. If he isn't in there already, Taylor, that would be a really wonderful so. outcome. <laughs> yes. Well, and I just want to say that's the biggest thing for me, you know, in doing this project, really to to for me the the biggest thing was you know you form this sort of connection you know to um people you know the person you're writing about and through the whole thing i came away i already had a lot of admiration for david aikman but i came away with so much more because this was someone who over the course of decades a decades of incredible turmoil the great depression world war ii you know, the Cold War, Vietnam, assassinations, all kind of stuff going on. And this was somebody, though, who through all of that just kept going. You know, he lived in a very tiny house. He lived a very humble life. He did, you know, they would buy a Cadillac every year for tax purposes. You know, they would record the mileage on it. And that was kind of a little gag they did. But, you know, this was somebody who was very, he never got above his raisin. He always stayed humble. And he always made people feel good, you know, in in very hard times. I mean, winter, winter time's not hard, I guess, but these were very hard times. And I I have uh, tremendous admiration for him. And I know there are a lot of people who remember Stream Bean, but there are a lot of people maybe who don't know who he was. And I, I think in, if this book can help to keep him out there or get him out there, uh, that would be, to me, the, the greatest uh, thing I can hope for. Uh, and um, I have a question, and I think before I, I, I tell you my question, um, I will just read a few comments and say if anyone 
else has a question they'd like to ask, please get it in the chat before we go. Um, there's a lot of really great comments. This is a terrific presentation. Thank you. I'm so anxious to read your book. Um, this was fascinating. Um, yeah, a lot of really, really great, really great comments here. Um, and while we wait for some more to roll in, I will ask my question. Um, so I'm really wondering, Taylor, about String Bean and just being like this character um, and kind of the relationship between comedy and country music and kind of a loose question, but there's such a strong relationship there. And he was one of the founding people on Hee Haw. And I'm wondering, do you think that he made a really big influence for other artists after him um, as far as being this kind of comedian? And, and Renee already asked a question about how you know, he developed that character, but I just think it's interesting, this comedy and country music and how there were a lot of people making these characters and how Stringy Beans is so unique, really. It's, there isn't really anyone like him. So what's kind of your thoughts on that? No, there really is not uh, uh, really any, as you say, anybody quite like him, <clears throat> pardon me. Um, you know, I mean, he was in a, he was in kind of a golden era of country comedy. Um, you know, he was best friends with Grand Paul Jones. He was on the stage with Minnie Pearl and Rod Brassfield. Uh, he was friends with Archie Campbell. Um, you know, and uh, all those, all the, you know, the people on the Hee Haw, you know, was Junior Samples and Lulu Roman, you know, just kind of geniuses in, in their particular style of comedy. Um, he was uh, actually friends with a very famous comic from Yazoo City, Mississippi, named Jerry Clower, who was on the Grand Ole Opry. In fact, Jerry Clower, one of his most famous stories was about a chainsaw, and uh, he actually gave Stream Bean a chainsaw that he used to cut wood on the last day of his life. Um, so, you know, he was really in a, in a golden age of a comedy when, when the idea of, of the comic act was, was pretty big uh you know on the stage in that era in many ways i think uh, now by the way there's a lot to be talked about with this there are scholars actually who who talk about the idea that this kind of country comic redneck kind of figure hillbilly figure is sort of um derives from some of the old uh minstrel kind of forms and in fact stream bean actually did perform in blackface or very early on in the 1930s when he was with Charlie Monroe. So with Charlie before he was a bill. So, you know, there is some of that kind of channeling through that people talk about. But a lot of the kind of comedy acts seem to be not as common in our time. Now, there are some people who still do it. I mentioned Leroy Troy, uh, Mike Snyder. Um, so, you know, I, there were definitely people who were influenced by him later. I, I suspect probably, if, I suspect a lot of those blue comedy, uh, blue collar comedy tour folks probably knew about string bean, you know, and so I, I think, um, you know, there's probably a certain, uh, excuse me, amount of that maybe still out there, but, um, but I think uh, that a lot of people kind of feel like the kind of comedy he was doing is not as common in our time. But anyway, yeah, I think he did have an influence probably in a lot of ways. Yeah. And thank you, by the way, for the comments uh, that you were reading, Tony, I appreciate it from people very much. Thank yeah, you for tuning in. The other thing I've seen in the chat um, at the very beginning is that Dave, who um, has been very helpful to us for one of our current exhibits, he has a plethora of knowledge about country music history. He was talking about Uncle Dave Macon had money in a bank that he had made a deposit on Friday, and by Monday, the bank had closed, and uh, that stuck with him. And so it, he was also one of those um, people of that generation who didn't really trust banks and was always carrying money like cash money on himself and then someone else mentioned a podcast called thanks for giving a damn the otis gibbs podcast that has a great episode on about the string bean murders so oh. i don't know if that was part of your research but it's not being produced no. anymore, but she says it's still accessible i don't know about that one i'm sorry to say yeah, uh, so but yeah you know there were so many people listen there were so many people in the depression and uh by the way, there's a great, fairly recent, maybe two or three years old or so, biography of Uncle Dave. Uh, I forget the name of the guy who wrote it, but uh, anyway, it's a great biography. And if you want to know more about him, I definitely would check that out. But yes, absolutely. He has been to the museum and done a book signing. Ah, 
<laughs> What's his name again? I keep thinking of it all well, the time. Now, now that you've said it, it's popped out of my head. I can see the book. <laughs> I can see the cover. And, I, and I've and i talked to him multiple times. But now that you've said it out loud, it's gone. So Sorry. it'll come to He's me great, at 4 a.m. this book. morning. So. <laughs> My, as a, Michael Dubler. Michael Dubler. Michael Dubler, yes. yes. It's a fine book. It's a great book on yeah. uh, Uncle Dave. Yeah. That's right. Michael well, Dubler. Yes. Well, I, I've been really commented sorry, in the chat. Me. Oh, I was just going to say the name just popped up in the chat right before it came to both of your brains. So, <laughs> Michael Dubler. <laughs> but um, I think the one other question that I just saw pop up, Tony, I don't know if you saw it, it came in amongst a bunch of others is someone asked about where you work now and, and your background to where you are right now. Again, just a little bit of your bio. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Pardon me. I, uh, I'm, uh, I'm live in South Florida. Um, so I'm, uh, I teach. I'm a professor at Florida Atlantic University, which is located in Boca Raton. Uh, you may know it because they made it to the final four for the first time in school history in basketball. And that kind of kind of put us on the map a little bit. <laughs> but um, anyway, that's where I am. And I've been uh, a lot of my, uh, you know, I'm a literary critic and English professor. And a lot of my scholarship prior to this time was on William Faulkner. Um, but throughout my life, I've had a lot of interest in uh, country. I was I'll put it this way, I was interested in country music and playing a guitar and banjo and harmonica and all that and piano long before uh, long before I became a, a professor. But uh, but that's what I do now. Well, this has been such a great presentation and we've had so many, like Tony said, there's been so many people saying how much they've enjoyed it and thanking you for your time. And, and I will just reiterate that and say thank you for being with us tonight and thank you to everyone who has been on Zoom with us. Taylor, it's been fascinating. Um, before we go, I just want to remind people that I'll be sending out a survey in the next couple of days that will also have the link to where the recording of tonight's presentation will go up on our website in about a week's time. So in a week's time, you can always go revisit it if you want to dig deep or you want to share it with someone. Um, and in fact, Charlotte Duncan, who has been with us for numerous of these programs, said this was the best one ever. So that was really oh, nice. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much. But I'll be sending that out. Um, so do answer the survey and then you can check out the video. Out the video. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to remind all of our audience, for those of you who are nearby, there's some cool stuff coming up. And for those of you who are just accessible by Zoom, there are ways for you to connect with us too. Um, our new special exhibit um, opened up in March. It's going to be with us through December 31st. It's called I've Endured Women in Old Time Music. And that's going to be a great opportunity um, to learn more about that part of country music history. Then on Thursday, May 11th at 7 p.m., that is two days from now, we have our Farm and Fun Time show featuring Jesse Daniel and Compton and Newberry. If you aren't nearby, remember you can watch that on Facebook Live. Saturday, May 13th from two to five, we have our monthly old time country and, blue and blues jam. And then on Thursday, May, sorry, Tuesday, May 23rd, you'd think with my glasses on, I could read properly. Tuesday, May 23rd, we have our music as work discussion panel and we'll have luthier and musician, Dr. Dina Jennings with us who makes gourd banjo. So you might find that interesting, um, Taylor. Yes, musician absolutely. and Appalachian dancer, Carla Gover and musician and educator, Emily Spencer talking to us about making a career in music as a woman. And that will be both in-person and virtual and free. So please look into that. And then Saturday, May 27th, from 2 to 5 p.m., we have our monthly Bluegrass Jam. Our next speaker series is on Tuesday, June 13th, and we're waiting for confirmation, but we're hoping to have journalist and author Holly Gleason talking about women in country music. Um, she is awesome. We've had her on our Radio Bristol Book Club before. She will be a great speaker, so watch this space. All of this can be found on birthplaceofcountrymusic.org backslash events. But again, Taylor, thank you. We've so appreciated it. Thank you to everyone who's been here with us and um, definitely go out and get Taylor's book. Thank you so much, everybody. I appreciate it so much. <laughs>